In this video, we'll consider allocations with respect to non-recourse deductions and go through a problem. On January 1st, year 1, Blueberry and Strawberry form Pop-Tart Limited Partnership, so it's a limited partnership, to acquire and operate a rental apartment building. Strawberry, who's the limited partner, contributes $90. Blueberry, the general partner, contributes $10. The partnership obtains a non-recourse loan, that's important, non-recourse loan, from an unrelated financial institution for $900 and purchases a building, which is on leased land, for $1,000. The $100 cash contributed by the partners and the $900 from the loan is what's used to pay the $1,000. The loan is secured by the building. The loan requires interest to be paid currently, but does not call for any principal payments for five years. The building is depreciable over 10 years at the rate of $100 per year, Assume unrealistically that this applies for both book and tax depreciation. So the partnership agreement contains the following provisions, and it's very important to note what's in the partnership agreement. First item, the agreement satisfies the alternate test for economic effect under Reg 1.704-1B2, 2 little i's d, meaning it contains all the requisite provisions for capital account maintenance and distribution of liquidation proceeds. Although Blueberry has a deficit makeup obligation, Strawberry does not because Strawberry is, of course, a limited partner. But the agreement does have a QIO, which is one of the requirements for the alternate test. So it's important to note that we're told from this problem the alternate test is met with respect to economic effects. So let's keep that in mind. Let's go to the next item. The agreement includes a minimum gain chargeback provision that complies with Reg 1.704-2F. That's very important. We have a minimum gain chargeback in place. And we're going to note that. So we have minimum gain chargeback in place. The third element of the partnership agreement, all income and loss other than non-recourse deductions are allocated 90% to Strawberry, who's a limited partner, and 10% to Blueberry until the first time the partnership recognizes income and gain that exceed losses sustained in prior years. Thereafter, all income, gain, and losses are allocated 50% to Blueberry and 50% to Strawberry. Let's understand what's going on here, because one of the most important things in partnership tax, especially when you deal with non-recourse deductions and allocations, is just focusing on what's going on with the partnership agreement and the actual facts of the problem. So think about the economics. Strawberry is a limited partner, contributes $90. Blueberry is a general partner, and contributes $10. The idea here is that most businesses, they don't make money the first few years. They usually lose money. The idea is that Strawberry wants to make sure that with respect to the business that the losses are allocated with respect to that $90 and $10 because economically if the business does not do well, Strawberry will then have to take the hit. So if Strawberry is going to economically bear this risk, well, for tax purposes, you better believe that Strawberry wants those benefits as well. Now, we're talking about the until the first time the partnership recognizes income and gain that exceed losses. They're talking about cumulative profit or loss. Cumulative profit or loss. As I mentioned, most businesses the first few years have losses when you think about all the expenses that go into the business, like operating expenses, uh, like advertising, setting up costs, um, uh, organization fees, filing fees, all those different types of things. And maybe they don't have the income they want those first few years. But if the business stay, actually is still in business after a few years, uh, generally it, it will reverse and start making profit. So the first few years that there's losses, the allocation, other than non-recourse deduction, will be allocated 90% to Strawberry, the limited partner, and 10% to Blueberry, which is according to their capital contributions. And then once you look at all of those years, once they start making a profit, which really means once the business exceeds $100 of capital contributed and they start going above that, then it's going to be 50-50. So keep that in mind that there's really two different allocations possible there. Two different allocations. Keep that in mind. The next item is that non-recourse deductions under the partnership agreement are allocated 80% to strawberry and 20% to blueberry. Finally, the last item deals with non-liquidating cash distributions. Non-liquidating cash distributions, liquidating of course, under the alternate test, liquidating cash distributions are in accordance with capital account balances. But non-liquidating cash distributions are specifically divided 10% to Blueberry and 90% to Strawberry until they have recovered their initial capital contributions, that $100. That 
that they each that they contribute a total, which means ten dollars to blueberry, ninety to strawberry. Thereafter, all non-liquidating liquidating cash distributions are shared 50-50. Now, the idea here is if you've ever seen Shark Tank or if you ever see venture capitalists, if they're going to invest, they want to become a senior owner, meaning that they're going to get back their share of distribution cash before any other owners get, get more than their fair share. So the fact that Strawberry, the limited partner, is contributing $90, you better believe that Strawberry does not want – Blueberry to receive a dollar more than the ten dollars that Blueberry contributed until Strawberry gets more than the ninety dollars that Strawberry contributed. That's the idea. So we're also told the income deductions of the partnership for years one, two, and three are as follows: rental income seventy dollars. This is in each year. Each year, by the way, each year. Rental income seventy dollars. Cash operating expenses ten dollars. Interest expense sixty dollars. Now, if we net those. Notice that it breaks even to zero, which leaves us with the depreciation expense, which is many times if you're taking a partnership tax course, my course or another professor, it usually works out that way. That all the income and deductions other than depreciation, they break even, and depreciation is kind of like the extra item. So keep that in mind. So the problem specifically asks for three areas of questions, but each question is really broken into different parts. So the first question is, is the 80-20 split of non-recourse deductions permissible? How much flexibility do Blueberry and Strawberry have to allocate partnership non-recourse deductions? And specifically, which of the following will be permissible? And I give some respective situations. Now, all three of these different uh, questions or problem sets are separate. The second deals with, assume that on January 1st, year 4, the partnership defaults on the mortgage and transfers the building, then worth $600, to the lender by deed in lieu of foreclosure and liquidates. What are the appropriate tax allocations and cash distributions to Blueberry and Strawberry for years 1 through 4? And then we're going to change it up into another problem. What if instead, on January 1st, year 4, the partnership sells the building for $1,100 and liquidates? What are the appropriate tax allocations and distributions to Blueberry and Strawberry? All right. So looking at the facts of the problem, we're dealing with allocations. We know that's an allocation issue, and looking at the actual questions themselves, we're dealing with allocation issues. So keep that in mind. Anytime you see a non-recourse liability on property that's attached, right here, the partnership obtains a non-recourse loan on a building. The non-recourse loan is $900. They take out $900 to acquire this building. Anytime you have a non-recourse liability, where the building is attached and no one is responsible, you got to worry about two, set of re two sets of regulations. You got to worry about the regulations for substantial economic effect under Reg 1.704-1, and you also have to worry about the regs for 1.704-2, non-recourse deductions. The starting point, though, will be looking at the non-recourse deductions rules. So let's start there. And if you are taking a partnership tax class, this analysis is extremely important. There's going to be some other analysis item that we're going to talk about, but this analysis is extremely important. So what you see here is a chart that I created in another video. It's the final product of that that deals specifically with non-recourse deductions, whether they're respected or not. So non-recourse deductions, we're going to talk about what those are, but within non-recourse deductions, there's also potential for substantial economic effect issues, which I have that chart as well below, and we'll talk about that. Subchapter K, you might remember, flexibility is the name of the game. Congress wanted to intend parties to have extreme flexibility when it comes to allocating as well as operating. Now, Section 704 specifically deals with what's called distributive share, which is really allocation. Allocation is different from distribution. Distributive share deals with what is the share of income, loss, deduction, credit that each partner or owner gets. The idea is that allocation... Remember that a partnership a, that's an entity taxed as a partnership for federal tax purposes, it's going to be treated as one level of tax at the owner level. Well, even if cash is not distributed out or property, we still allocate that, and that's distributive share. So the main thing is that it must be the, the allocation for non-recourse deductions must be listed in the partnership agreement. Okay, well, we have that. Okay, so the allocation will be respected if it's in the partnership agreement. Well, we're told what the allocations are for income gain loss other than non-recourse deduction in different situations as well as non-recourse. So we have that in the partnership agreement. If we didn't, we'd have the partner's interest in the partnership rule, which is factors, which we'll talk more about that in a moment. 
Okay, if it's in the partnership agreement, it also has to have substantial economic effect. So now we come into a come to a fork in the road because in this problem, you're going to see that some years, well, specifically one year, it's going to be the normal substantial economic effect rules under Reg 1.704-1. How do we know which rules apply? We look at the adjusted basis of the property that has a non-recourse liability, and we then compare to the amount of the liability at the end of the year or during the year because it could change during the year. And we specifically see, okay, if the adjusted basis is greater than or equal to the liability, we apply the normal substantial economic effect rules. If the adjusted basis is less than the liability at any point during the year, we got to apply the non-recourse deduction rules under Reg 1.704-2. So at some point during this problem, we're going to have both of these because I want to illustrate that. Just continuing on, let's say that we're in a year where we have non-recourse deductions, Reg 1.704-2 controls. Well, there's a safe harbor, and the safe harbor is found in 2E, 1.704-2E. Now, the reason why the safe harbor is so important is because we do not, I repeat, we do not want the partner's interest in the partnership. We do not want that apply. Why? Because it's all about certainty. Certainty is the name of the game, especially when you have non-recourse deductions. Here's the issue. If you're a tax professional and you're hired by a client for drafting purposes, compliance, planning, they want to make sure that the allocation is going to be respected by the IRS. If you go back to a client and say, well, I'm sorry, but the allocation is not going to be respected under Safe Harbor, so we have to go to the factors test, and we're not 100% sure, and it might be recharacterized by the IRS, that's not good. The taxpayer can sue you potentially for malpractice and various other issues. So we want to avoid at all costs the partner's interest in the partnership rules, the factors test under Reg 1.704-1B3, two little i's, which can apply both to the normal SCE rules and the non-recourse deduction rules. So we want to avoid that. So how do we avoid that? The safe harbor is found in Reg 1.704-2E. First thing the safe harbor establishes is that you have to meet either the basic test or the alternate test. So that's why we're going through starting with analyzing, hey, do we meet the basic test for substantial economic effect or the alternate test? Let's start with the basic test. So the basic test is found in Reg 1.704-1B2, 2 little ib, and the citations are obviously important. And I've done a video on, on these economic effect tests under the substantial economic effect. So you can go and you can visit that and go more depth. So this is not meant to be in any way exhaustive, but it is meant to be important because it's it's important. There's three requirements. The capital accounts must be maintained in accordance with Reg 1.704-1B2, little iv. The positive capital on liquidation, so when the uh, business liquidates, it does so in accordance with positive capital accounts. And the third is unlimited deficit restoration. If you meet all three of those, there's some additional requirements under Reg 1.704-2E Safe Harbor. But we don't meet that. We don't meet all three in this case. Why? We have a limited partnership. If we meet the first two but fail the last, then we go on to the alternate test. Now, this specific partnership agreement, as we read, and you can go back if you want in the video, it specifically says, hey, we meet the alternate test. So we actually are in the case where we meet the first two but fail the third. If we were to fail the first or second, we would be um, partners' interest in the partnership, which is A, the A, box A here. Again, factors, we do not want that. No, 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 we don't want that. So we're the alternate test, and we're told specifically, remember, alternate test is qualified income offset in the agreement, and you cannot go beyond zero deficit um, that's committed by the by the limited partner. And the alternate test is found in Reg 1.704-1B2, two little i's, D. Now, the idea here is in this problem, you're told, hey, the alternate test applies. But you might not be, your, your professor might not be that generous. You might not be told, hey, the alternate test applies. You might have to go through all these requirements. And that's what you're doing. You're establishing these at some point in your problem to show your path, your reasoning. You need to do that. Okay, so the alternate test, now we're told in our problem it's met, but if we fail either of these in the alternate test, again, it's going to be the partner's interest in the partnership. We don't want that. One thing to note, remember the basic test is all or nothing. We talked about that in that video for substantial economic effect. The alternate test, though, can apply in one year and then another year doesn't apply. The same is true here. If the alternate test is met for any year that cannot go beyond zero deficit, then you're fine as long as it's good for at least one year or part of a year even. You're good. You have that set forth. So we know the alternate test is met. If the basic test or alternate test is met, then you go on to the two additional requirements of Reg 1.704-2E. The two additional requirements are listed here, and they are very important. 
The first is that the allocation for non-recourse deductions must be within the range of other allocations with substantial economic effect. Now, I'm going to explain this one more, and there's actually a, one, of the, one of the problems, one of the questions that's being asked addresses this issue. So we're going to go back into that in depth. But, so just assume for right now we meet that. The second is that the agreement has a minimum gain chargeback. Okay, well, our partnership agreement, we got that. That's excellent. I want to stress how important the minimum gain chargeback is. The minimum gain chargeback is the heart of the non-recourse deduction safe harbor. I'm going to explain that in a moment. Now, if we meet the basic test or alternate test and these two requirements, hey, look at that. The allocation is respected. If we fail either of these two requirements, even though we meet the basic or alternate test, it's going to be under partner's interest of partnership. Eh, we don't want that. Uh-uh. We don't want that. Bad. All right. So in doing this analysis, let me explain how you do this on an exam or how you do this, whatever you're doing. Okay. You need to go through each year, starting from the very beginning, and lay this out, starting with the rules you see here. And I have a video that goes over non-recourse deductions, and it lays out the order. So what's filled in here is the product of that video, the end product. But if you go through that video, it lays out the ordering of how you should analyze. If you do that, your teacher will be impressed, and your professor will be uh, prof uh, impressed, get all the points, boom. Because this is an area of logical understanding, how everything fits together. It's like a big puzzle, how everything fits, the order. So go through that video in that order. Now, another thing, in addition to writing out these tests and how everything is met and explaining, you also want to keep track of four things. And we're going to do that in this problem. We're going to keep track of these four things so I can show you. So each year we keep track of the capital accounts, the amount of the liability, the book value, and also the adjusted basis. Specifically, we're going to focus on the adjusted basis because that's what's important. And then the partnership minimum gain in each partner's share. So that partnership minimum gain, that PMG that I'm talking about, that is the heart. That's that minimum gain chargeback in each partner's share. So the idea there, there was a case called Tufts. Crane and Tufts, but mainly Tufts. Tufts dealt with a non-recourse liability, and a lender took on, had a, took the property back, and we had an issue related to that. So the idea is, if you have a non-recourse liability, which remember, non-recourse liability means that no one is at, bears the economic risk, no specific partner. Well, the idea is, let's say that the property has gone down in value, and the um, business forecloses, and now the lender is the one that bears the risk. Well, the idea there is, well, we can't tax cannot follow, follow book. And that's the reason why we have a special set of rules for non-recourse deduction. We can't just follow the normal substantial economic effect rules because we can't allocate to the lender. The reason why we can't do that, by the way, is because the Tufts and the Crane case, the, they would, it would affect the tax jurisprudence there. So we, just, we allocate using these rules. The partnership minimum gain is basically a matching idea. It basically says, let's say that the property um, with this liability is defaulted on or sold or whatever. The amount realized when the adjusted basis is less than the liability, the amount realized equals the liability. That's the amount realized under Section 1001. And then the adjusted basis is the adjusted basis of property at that date. That gives us a gain that the partnership reports. And the character would be, you know, if it, they sold the assets, so if it's 1231 or it's 1245 recapture, if it's personal depreciable property or amortizable intangible intellectual property, whatever it is, we have a partnership minimum gain. The character, again, is if they sold the asset, so 1231 or under capture section 1250, all those items. We also have to determine the partner's share. And that's what the minimum gain chargeback, it stresses. It makes sure that you keep track, you match. You match each partner's share of the benefit that they got over time. That's the minimum gain chargeback. So that's really everything when it comes to non-recourse deductions. So when we're doing the problem later on, I'm not going to go through and analyze the, and how, what you see here because I've already done it for you, but that's what you would want to do on your exam at least once. Show this analysis. You definitely want to show this right here where, hey, in one year, the adjusted basis might be greater than or equal to the liability, but the next year, hey, that changes. And when it switches in a specific year, that's when you got to focus on the NRD rules, the non-recourse deduction rules. Another thing I want to mention is, hey, within these years, you might have substantial economic effect to worry about. Well, again, I have a video on substantial economic effect, and that's what you see here. This is the product of that. So please go back over that video, right? It's a similar kind of structure, but the key in this video is you have to have substantiality, economic effect. We're going to assume in this problem substantiality is met. That's what I do in my exams. I focus on economic effect, go through the basic test, the alternate test, right? If we fail either of those, we got certain determinations, we've got economic equivalents, partner's interest in the partnership, we got all these elements. 
So go back over that substantial economic effect because in a year where substantial economic effect applies for a non-recourse liability problem, you got to go through and analyze this same way. Showing capital account analysis, showing the order, boom, all that good stuff. Writing it out subjectively, writing out, you know, again, it's all about the law, the, the structure of how you're, you're, um, you're structuring your argument, the flow. Also, the citations are very important. I have all the citations here for substantial economic effect in that video, and it walks you through the order, as well as there are some citations here for non-recourse deduction, and that video also walks you through the order. Okay, so let's go back to our problem. So the first thing is, we got this, the 80-20 split of non-recourse deductions. Is it permissible? How much flexibility do Blueberry and Strawberry have to allocate the partnership non-recourse deductions? Specifically, which of the following would be permissible? And then give three different situations. We're going to go through those. So <clears throat> here's what's going on. This question is not asking for a specific year. It's just saying, hey, assume that you're in NRD land. Assume that you're in NRD, a year of NRD, non-recourse deduction rules. In terms of determining if the NRD applies, okay, go back to our graph. So we are here. We are non-recourse deduction. We know we meet the alternate test, so then we go to our two additional requirements. Within range of the of other allocations that meet substantial economic effect, and the agreement has a minimum gain chargeback. Well, we're told in the facts, hey, look at this. We got our minimum gain chargeback, right? B says minimum gain chargeback. So now the key is, hey, is the 80-20 allocation and all these other allocations, are they within within range of allocations that would meet substantial economic effect in certain years? So let's look. If we look at our partnership agreement, E is irrelevant, right? It's irrelevant because that deals with non-liquidating cash distributions. That is not allocation. Remember, distribution and allocation is not the same. Non-recourse deductions is D. We can ignore that as well because, hey, we're focusing on allocations with respect to SCE. A and B deal with the alternate test, the minimum gain chargeback, no allocation items there. But look at C. We got two allocations here. These allocations are the SCE allocations. There's two of them. It's possible in one year or another year to meet these respective allocations under SCE, right? It depends on how the business is doing. If the business is doing well, right, it's 50-50, right? And when you think of the, cum the cumulative profit, when the business is not doing well, it's the 90-10, 90 to strawberry, 10 to blueberry. So it's possible under SCE to meet both of those because we meet the alternate tests as long as strawberry does not go below zero. That's the idea here under state law. So what does that do? It sets up a range. It sets up a range. So we got blueberry, I'll just denote B, and strawberry. So when we are in a good year, blueberry is allocated 50. Okay, wait, I'm sorry, my apologies. Let's start with a bad year. Let's start with a bad year. In a bad year, blueberries start, uh, allocate 10% of the losses or gains or whatever. In a good year, blueberry is allocated 50. Strawberry in a bad year is allocated 90. And in a good year, is allocated 50. So bo since both of these allocations, right, the 10, 90, 50, 50 allocations meet SEE because, again, we meet the, allo we meet the um, alternate tests. And we just, we just consider it an overall in general, that idea. Okay? Then we need to go through... 80, 20, and then these also, these three situations, here, here, and here, to see if they meet. Because the question is asking, okay, well, how much flexibility do they have? And then specifically, which of these would be permissible? So let's first start with the 80, 20. So that's 80 strawberry. Remember the problem said that 80% strawberry for non-recourse deductions, 80% are allocated to strawberry, 20% to blueberry. So it has to fall in this range. If it falls outside the range, and it can be on the cusp, that's fine. If it falls outside the range, that's bad, and it won't, will not be respected. Okay, so if strawberry is allocated 80, we are here, okay? And if blueberry is allocated, let's do colors for this to denote. Let's just do some colors. So I'm going to use, yeah, let's use black, black circles for um, the 80-20, so let's continue. So if strawberry is allocated 80, we're right here. If blueberry is allocated 20, we're right here. Hey, we're within the range. That will be respected. That's good. That's within that range. So that's what we're talking about. When we're talking about this requirement within the range of other allocations that have substantial economic effect, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about that item right there. 
So that's just that one. We got three more tests. Let's do a different color. Let's choose. Let's do red. Red for 50-50, the next one. So this is going to be our red. Okay, if it's 50-50, we got 50 for blueberry, 50 for strawberry. Hey, we're on the cusp, and we're good. So that one is fine. We are good there. As long as you are within the range or on the cusp, that's good. Okay, let's do the 1090. 10 to blueberry, 90 to strawberry. Let's do blue for that one. So we're going to do blue for that one. Okay, 10% to blueberry, 90% to strawberry. Hey, we're on the cusp again, but that's still fine. We're good. Finally, let's do 1%, 99%. Let's do green for that one. So we're going to do green for this one. So now we're up here for blueberry. And we're down here for strawberry. Uh-oh. We're not within the range or on the cusps. We are outside. Bad. That one would not be respected. And if you did not have that, look at our, our chart. Well, we would fail number one. And if we fail number one, uh-oh. We are partners interested in partnership, and that is not good. We do not want that. We do not want to be here. This is bad. We do not want to be partners interested in partnership. Gets us into a lot of trouble. Okay. So that's all that question is asking and addressing. It's showing you this range and how things work. If an allocation can be ever have substantial economic effect, which it can because we have the alternate test for both of those, right? The 50-50 and the 1090, then that's the range we focus on. All right. Let's go now to the next question. Assume that on January 1st, year four, the partnership defaults on the mortgage and transfers the building, then worth $600, to the lender by deed in lieu of foreclosure and liquidate. So the business is going to liquidate. What are the appropriate tax allocations and cash distributions of blueberry and strawberry for years one through four? All right. So let's create some room. We're going to draw over here. So we need to create a table. Now, again, when you're doing this problem, you need to consider first the idea, the order, and the analysis. So the order and the analysis, that is what we just talked about, those two charts. So if you have a problem, your professor gives you a problem, or you have something in practice where you need to like write a memo to know how this all stuff works, you go through that order. You go in that order. For substantial outcome effect, for non-recourse deductions, you lay it out, you lay out the rules, boom. You make sure that you document everything. In addition to documenting that and showing the order, so if you are taking my class, you need to go through that order and explain, hey, what tests we meet, all that good stuff. Go through, hey, why do we meet the safe harbor for non-recourse deduction? Why do we meet the safe harbor for substantial economic effect if that rule applies? But you also have to do an analysis of capital, an analysis of the liability, the adjusted basis, and the partnership minimum gain with the partner's allocation of that. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw some columns here. So the first thing is going to be the capital accounts. We're going to keep track of the capital accounts. Now we have two partners. We've got Blueberry and Strawberry. So we're going to create a little line for those. We always keep track of our capital accounts, our book capital accounts. That is very important because remember, non-recourse deduction, we keep track of that item. Okay. So now the next thing we're going to determine, and I know it's out of order on the list, but this will help us understand. We're going to keep track of the adjusted basis of the building. Remember the land has been being leased so that is irrelevant. So this is the adjusted basis, the tax basis. It's also the book basis in this problem as well. We also are going to keep track of the liability amounts, but I'm going to create a little, a little line there, and you'll see what that line is going to be used for later. So this is the liability amount. And finally, I'm going to, we need to keep track of the partner Ship minimum gain, and then that's going to be allocated over between B and S, blueberry and strawberry. Okay, so I'm going to put a little line here, and then what comes next is going to be the share of that, the share of that respective item, their share broken up. 
All right. So we're starting with January 1st, year one. Okay. January 1st, year one. The balance. So going back to our facts, and I just remember these facts, but if you need to go back to the facts, that's fine. You can look at the facts. You can stop the video and go back. We got capital accounts, right? Our starting capital accounts, B contributed $10 and S contributed $90. The adjusted basis of the building is $1,000. How did I get that? Because remember, $900 was taken out as a non-recourse liability, right? That's our non-recourse liability here. So $900. And then $100 was used from the capital accounts contributed, um, the cash contributed by BNS total. The partnership minimum gain, well, this is when the adjusted basis is greater, I'm sorry, the adjusted basis is less than the liability, which unfortunately right now, look, it's greater than or equal to the liability. So partnership minimum gain is zero, so we don't have to allocate. So that is the first item. That is the first item. Okay? Then we got our year one depreciation now we have to think about a few things before we go ahead and start writing in this one you have to kind of do things a little bit backwards okay before we go to the capital accounts and the partnership minimum gain and all that good stuff we know that a hundred dollars of depreciation will be taken we know that for sure we know $100 of depreciation will be taken from the building for tax purposes. So we know the ending adjusted basis of the building is going to be $900. The liability, we know none of it's going to be paid off in years one through five. So the end of year one, it's still $900. So therefore, the adjusted basis is greater than or equal to $900 of liability. So if we go back to our rules, right? If we go back to the non-recourse deduction rules, look at this. And we look at, hey... Are we under Reg 1.704-1 normal SCE rules, or are we under Reg 1.704 non-recourse deduction rules? If we're looking at that, look at this. Right now, at the end of year one, we are adjusted basis is greater than or equal to liability. We are still under the normal SCE rules. So if we're applying the normal SCE rules, we apply the normal SCE rules like we have here. Right? We need, assuming, again, we're going to assume substantiality is met. We go through economic effect. We're told in the problem that alternate test is met. Well, we know that since... The, um, strawberry is a limited partner. Strawberry cannot go below zero because nothing is said that specifically strawberry can go negative. So that means the allocation will be respected as long as strawberry's capital account does not go below zero. If it goes below zero, then we're going to have to do certain determinations, this rule right here, and apply that, which is, remember, you compare the beginning of the year, end of the year book values. All right. So let's go back to our analysis now. So we know that we are applying... In year one, we know we're applying the SCE rules, Reg 1.704-1. You want to you wanna make sure you highlight that and harp on that and go through that analysis, what I just did on your exam. Very important. Under the SCE rules, Reg 1.704-1, you'd want to note that. Okay, we meet the alternate test. We're told that. And if we think about our allocations, right, we have a di three different ways we can allocate. C and D is where we find our allocations. Well, this is not a non-recourse deduction. So we are, because we are not, the, because the adjusted basis is not less than the liability, so we go to C. Well, remember, it's the cumulative profit or loss. At the end of year one, all that's happened is we've lost money from the depreciation. Everything else broke even. So we're going to apply the 90% to strawberry, 10% to blueberry. So now let's go back to our analysis. If we use that 90%, 10%, the $100 depreciation, 90 to strawberry, 10 to blueberry, and that brings strawberry down to zero and blueberry down to zero. Okay? So we are good. As long as strawberry does not go negative, then the SCE will be respected and we are good. And that is what happens at the end of year one. Everything looks good. Okay. And also at the end of year one is also the beginning of year two. Just remember that. End of year one rolls over beginning of year two. So now we have year two depreciation. Year two depreciation. And again, we're going to take... Another $100. Another $100. So we can go ahead and take that off the building, $100. So the year two ending, we're going to have a book value, or sorry, adjusted basis in the building of $800. The liability does not change. Uh-oh, look at this. The adjusted basis in the building is now less during the whole year. 
the whole year because we started at equal, right? It was equal to $900. Now it's the, during the whole year when depreciation is taken, guess what? $800 is less than $900. So that means that we are applying not re, non-recourse deductions. Considering our rules, right? Remember, we go through this. We meet the alternate test, and we ha we are within the range. The 80-20 is within the range, as we did in the previous problem. And then the agreement has a minimum gain chargeback. We are good, as long as we keep track of these items. And also, we keep in mind these various um, elements. Okay. So the non-recourse deduction, well, that ratio is not 90-10. It's 80-20. So strawberry gets allocated 80, and blueberry gets allocated 20. So now the negative capital account is 20 and negative 80. Now, some of you might be wondering, before we finish off, we still have to do the end of uh, year two for the partnership minimum gain. Some of you might be wondering, hey, I thought that strawberry cannot go negative. Well, strawberry cannot go negative as a result of SEE. But with respect to partnership minimum gain, yes, strawberry can go negative. And the reason why is because this is a tax item. As long as the we have a partnership minimum or minimum gain chargeback. The minimum gain chargeback is the heart. What it's going to do is it's going to match. It's going to match any benefits that Strawberry gets, and it's going to require, hey, Strawberry, when upon certain events, you got to record that. Even though you're a limited partner, you have to record that, and you have to take into account that gain. So you will your 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 capital account will balance and go to zero. One thing I want to mention as well is that a minimum gain chargeback is not the same as a QIO. A QIO, which is part of the alternate test, that deals with unexpected events that, are, that only occur during substantial economic effect rules. So a QIO can never be triggered during um, whenever you're dealing with NRD rules. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Okay. So that allocation is fine. We do have PMG. It's the difference between the adjusted basis and the liability, 100, and we keep track. We keep track of what the respective partners got. Well, there's 20. And 80. So we're keeping track of this, but in no way do they have to record that. They only record it when an event, a triggering event. Now we're doing a basic analysis of these rules for this problem. Okay? We're only doing a basic analysis. So what you're going to see is that the only event that's going to trigger it in this in these problems are going to be when it's liquidated. I'm sorry, when it's uh, foreclosed on or sold. That's it. But you could have whenever the PMG decreases, you could have respective uh, share of uh, partner minimum gain has to be recorded. Okay, now we go to year three, and year three is going to be identical because look at this. Year three depreciation, we write that out. Year three ending. Okay, well, if we take another 100 from the building, now we're down to 700. Okay, and the liability is 900 or less. Hey, the whole year we were NRD. So again, it's um, take 20 and 80. That brings our balance at the end of year uh, three to negative 40 for B and negative 160 for um, S, strawberry. And then our partnership minimum gain is the difference between the 700 and 900, which is 200. And the share of that is 40 for blueberry and 160 for strawberry. It's the amount of benefit they got during the NRD years. Okay. So now we're at the end of year three. And the problem, as it asked us to look at, it says, assume in January 1st, year 4, which is the end of year 3, the partnership defaults on the mortgage and transfers the building, then we're $600 to the lender. Because it's not recourse liability, no one's responsible, the property's attached, so guess what? The respective uh, lender bears the risk. Okay? So when that partnership defaults and the partner, I'm sorry, the, the bank takes it on, now we have a triggering event. It triggers this $200 of partnership minimum gain. And let me explain specifically how this works. So I'm going to break this up underneath. When the partnership defaults or forecloses and the building has a value of $600, 600 fair market value, the building's value is irrelevant. The amount realized, so we apply section 1001 to the partnership. The amount realized equals the amount of the liability at the date, the beginning of year um, four, it's the same at the end of year three. We have a $900 liability. That's our amount realized. Minus the adjusted basis, which is $700. The $200 partnership minimum gain, the partnership reports this on its form 1065. And the character is whatever it would be if it was sold. 
probably 1231 asset with under capture section 1250 since the building has been depreciated. We break that up with respect to the partner's share. So we go here, right? We got 40 for B and 160 for Strawberry, and that's their share. So we have 40 of that 200 goes to Blueberry, and 160 goes to Strawberry, and that goes on their K1s. So that goes to Blueberry's K1 is a 1231. If again, assuming it's used in business and under capture section 1250 K1, and then 160 goes to section 1231 K1. So that is what happens in that situation. We then are going to have to report that gain, and remember the partnership is going to liquidate. So what does that look like for the capital accounts? So year four gain, we do positive 40 and 160. That brings the balance at the beginning of um, January 1st, year four to zero for both. The building is now gone. The liability is gone. And there's no partnership minimum gain. Everything is now zero. And yes, at the end of liquidation, you want everything to be zero. So that is good. We've done good there. Okay, we've done good there. All right. So that is what happens with respect to if the partnership liquidates. Again, the $600 value is irrelevant. You just focus on the $700, the uh, just a basis, and the $900 liability, and the amount realized just a basis under Section 1001, calculation of realized and recognized gain or loss for the partnership. What if instead, on January 1st, year four, the partnership sells the building for $1,100, so it's going to sell it, and liquidates? What are the appropriate tax allocations and distributions to blueberry and strawberry? So this one's a little bit more challenging. So I'm going to erase what we just did in terms of the gain or loss calculation, but the end of year three stays the same. Everything stays the same as a result of the end of year three. We're still at the same balances, negative 40 and 160. But let's just kind of think about what's going on here. So the on January 1st, the alternative situation, this is separate from what we just did, January 1st, year four, partnership sells the building to somebody, a third party, for $1,100 cash. So, of course, we apply Section 1001. The amount realized is what the partnership gets, which is $1,100 minus the adjusted basis. Okay, the end of year three, beginning of year four, $700. Partnership has a $400 gain. So the question is, how does this gain, how is it recorded? By the partnership and also by, respectively, the partners. So we're going to have three levels of how we allocate this gain. I'm going to explain each of these, and it really helps you understand what's going on here. First thing, minimum gain chargeback comes into play, always. So we have to trigger that PMG. Well, for the partnership, that's going to be $200. And we allocate that between blueberry and strawberry in accordance with, again, their share, the 40 and 160. So we're going to allocate that 40 and 160. All right, next. So the next element of that $400 gain Okay, we're allocating that $400 gain. The next element, we have to understand what's going on economically. So at the beginning of this partnership, remember, strawberry contributes $90, blueberry contributes $10. Everything else is borrowed. So this is what's going on. We're selling a building for $1,100. We're going to pay off our creditors. Okay, think about on liquidation. On liquidation, because after this problem, liquidation occurs. The business has $1,100 cash after this transaction. What's the first thing it's going to do? It's going to pay off. It's going to pay off the creditors. So it's going to first pay off the $900 liability to the bank. So it's no longer going to owe that. That'll be zero. We have $200 left. $200 left. Okay. Next, think about our partnership agreement. This is not a non-liquidating cash distribution. This is liquidating. All income and loss and other than non-recourse are allocated 90% to strawberry, 10% to blueberry, and this is also how we're allocating this respective gain. Now, this first $100 is not yet considered a cumulative profit. Why? Because a cumulative profit would be any profit beyond the amount they contribute. They both contributed together $100, so beyond the $100. So that's basically saying, hey, the first $100 of that $200 left will go in accordance with the capital account contributions. So strawberry is allocated 90 what they what he or she contributed and blueberry is allocated 10. Okay? So we're going to do that. So next, we have the $100 
which is from the initial contribution. All right. $100 from the initial contribution. And that's allocated nine, sorry, 10 to B, 90 to S. And again, think about economically what's going on, right? Bank got back its money. Now we got $200 left. Next appropriate element when you're considering Q and a profit is to give the investors back their money, right? So strawberry gets back his or her 90. Blueberry gets back his or her 10. We've got $100 left. The $100 left, according to the partnership agreement, anything beyond the cumulative profit position, we're told, hey, it's 50-50. And that's when the 50-50 is triggered. So now that $100 goes 50-50 between the owners. So that is all pure profit. So this is $100 of contribution. And now we have $100 of profit beyond, right? So that's going to be 50-50. So the gain is going to be allocated $100 of the $400 gain, the partnership records, $100 of the gain is allocated to Blueberry, $300 to Strawberry. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to record that. So year four, gain. We're going to give $100 to Blueberry, $300 to Strawberry. Think about the balances here. So if you were to net these numbers... Okay, if you net these numbers, then what happens is you got forty, so it's sixty dollars here, and then one three hundred minus one sixty, that's going to be one forty. And if you think about it, the partnership agreement, because it meets the alternate test, means that hey, you got to follow capital account balances, positive capital account balances on liquidation. So all these other items, by the way, are zero because they're all gone. We have no partnership minimum gain. That's all zero, zero. We zeroed that out. Okay, we paid those off those items as we showed. So the last step is, okay, we're going to allocate in accordance with positive capital account balances. So we're going to give each of these. So Blueberry, in the end of the day, there's $200 of cash left in the business. Blueberry gets 60. Strawberry gets 140. And hey, guess what? This works out. How does it work out? Because look, after paying the owners economically, Strawberry got $90 back and $50. If you add those two together, you get $140. Hey, that's right. And then Blueberry got back the 10 that Blueberry contributed plus the 50 profit made, and that's 60. So boom, we're good. And because everything follows and we matched, we're good. It's key, it's key to understand that because of the partnership minimum gain and the minimum gain chargeback, that is matched. That's matched and we're good. We're good to go there. The SCE rules also kept us in place for tax matching book. And that's what also made sure that, hey, on liquidation, in accordance with positive capital count balances, everything will work out. All right, so I hope you've enjoyed this problem. This one is a long one, but it's also very important. Please go back through it. And again, whenever you're doing your analysis, make sure not to just focus on this capital count analysis and these numbers, but also to go through the ordering, right, and structure your analysis something like this and show your professor, hey, this is the order stuff goes, along with also substantial economic effect and non-recourse deduction. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please watch the other videos on partnership taxation.